to our last presentation with uh, Dr. Ed Burns. I don't know a single person who's, who's not been impacted personally or who has friends or family or loved ones who've been affected by the impact of COVID-19 and, and particularly on their mental health. So I'm delighted that we've got Ed with us today. He's a consultant psychiatrist and he's the clinical director for outpatient and wellbeing services at Priory Group. And he's going to talk to us about how business can meet its duty of care to employees in the current climate. So without any further ado, Ed, over to you. Thank you, Stuart, and thank you for the opportunity to talk today. What I'm going to try and do at the beginning, as everybody else has done, is put up my presentation, which hopefully people will have to get a copy of afterwards. Hopefully everybody can see that and I'll be able to skip through the slides appropriately. So, yeah, as Stuart said, I'm a consultant psychiatrist. I've been working in mental health for about the last 17 years. Um, and I think that um, there's been lots of changes over, those over that time of the conversations around recognition of uh, mental health. And I think, as, as you said, Stuart, it's been something that's been really prominent um, throughout COVID. And I've seen people, I've seen things sort of go very quiet. I've seen things start to build up. And then I've seen people who've had no issues with their mental health before come to uh, see me. So there's a few different things that I want to think about today. So the first bit is really thinking about sort of how do we recognize mental health issues? So as an employer, how do we recognize those mental health, health issues? But also as an individual, a, a lot of the time this sort of creeps up on people. And a lot of people I see, it's a buildup of stress of different situations. It might be at home, it might be at work. And COVID has become sort of this perfect storm where we're not able to get away from home or uh, do the things that we would normally do. And it's also thinking about what can insurers do. And then finally, I just want to think about what Priory can do as well. So maybe to start with what we need to think about, we've talked uh, already today about well-being, but and we've heard lots over the last uh, year from the World Health Organization about COVID and about what uh, sort of definitions of things, but just a definition of well-being is about people being able to reach their potential, people being able to, to do what they want to do, that they're able to feel uh, they contribute to the community, that they can manage their work, that they're dealing with stress, because stress is a normal part of day-to-day -day life, but what we need to think about is when does that tip into something being a mental illness? For me, seeing somebody with mental illness or a mental disorder, it's very unique for that individual. Everyone who has a mental health problem will experience different problems to the person next to them. Um, I think Barry was just saying about the number of people at work who have seen colleagues who've had mental health issues, and it is really common that a lot of people that I see struggle to say to somebody at work, they feel that it's a sign of weakness, that it's something that they can't talk about, that they shouldn't raise it if they say that they've got difficulties, that it's going to lead to problems. So a lot of the time what we see is this, it's an invisible illness and quite often when I see patients for the first time in the room, it might be the first time they've come to see me uh, or see anybody to talk about their mental illness. Um, and people are very frightened about it. There's a lot of self-stigmatizing about the fact that they should have been able to rise above this. COVID has thrown up a huge amount of problems for all of us. At the beginning of the pandemic, I had to work in my clinical director role of closing uh, hospitals, not closing them to, uh, to people coming in, but making sure that we were safe, that people weren't visiting, that we were thinking about, instead of everybody coming to see me, I've had to do everything via Zoom or Skype or do everything remotely. And that's, it's been really hard for people to do that. But when people do start talking about their mental illness, the key thing that I have to identify is that normally a mental illness or a mental disorder is when there's a change from their mental well-being state to the mental disorder. And it's a change in functioning. And that can be quite insidious. And it's something to just bear in mind as we go through, through this today. So what things might you see with someone? Well, people might report problems with sleep, eating, their agitation. It may be that colleagues notice it. Uh, it might be partners notice different things at home. But often there's lack of confidence, issues around concentration. Um, and then you sometimes things build up and it builds up to the level of depression or anxiety or psychosis. And essentially then people don't have mental well-being. They're unable to do the things that they want to do. They're unable to engage in work in a meaningful way. 
you're unable to engage in relationships and other aspects of their day-to-day life. And that's when they, they need to get some support. Ideally, what we want to do is do things like you life or other uh, services where you're actually stepping in and preventing things from getting unwell. The best thing is to do prevention and then it's early detection and early intervention to treat. One thing that might be useful to sort of highlight to um, employ, uh, employees and to think about for ourselves is looking at this stress zone map and looking at where we sit at. Everybody needs a little bit of stress. We don't really want to sit in that drone zone where we've got no stress. We're not actually having to do anything. Everything's just sort of ticking along. But actually with that, you start getting bored. You don't then produce and it can lead to other problems. A little bit of stress is helpful. We need a little bit of stress. I know myself that um, from a personal point of view, I need a little bit of stress to keep going and, I, and to motivate me and to get things done. But when it starts to get too much, I start tipping past that season where I'm cool, calm and collected into the fatigue or the exhaustion zone or getting worse down into that panic or burnout zone. So I need to try and make sure that we think about recognizing it ourselves. And um, there are certain things that we can do to try and manage that. But the first thing is identifying and recognizing it. I noted at the beginning of COVID that I was really struggling with sleep, the amount of decisions, the amount of pressure, the amount of people becoming unwell. And as a doctor, feeling that I have to stay well, I have to be able to stay well to look after everybody else, and I have to be able to do those things. And that's really difficult. There's actually been a um, study from the BMA talking about this uh, moral injury of uh, healthcare workers needing to deal with huge amounts of really difficult decisions. Intensive care consultants having to decide whether somebody is eligible to access care or not. So mental health issues for um, healthcare workers is likely to have risen during this time. There's suggestions from uh, a lot of studies that show that people who've survived COVID actually have higher rates of psychiatric diagnosis. So people who didn't have issues before are presenting for the first time. And those who did have a psychiatric history they're potentially things get worse for them, but also that may be an independent factor for them developing COVID. It might be a risk factor. Uh, there's actually some suggestions today that there's a, a lobby being put forward that people with uh, mental health conditions should actually be near the front of the line for um, vaccines because actually they are at high risk. Um, they, we know that the morbidity and mortality for people with severe and enduring mental illness is really high. It's disproportionately high in the comparison to the general population. So we really need to think about supporting the physical needs for people who've got mental health issues as well. At the beginning of the pandemic, people started talking about that we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, but one of the things that I was very mindful of was that there was going to be a rise in need for mental health services. Um, and I remember talking to my secretary and saying that we're, we're quieter now because certain things have changed within the hospital. There's fewer people possibly coming in. We're still open. But numbers seem to dip. People, there seemed to be a bit of a, a wartime spirit and people sort of got behind this. And I think as things have gone on for longer, people have realized that actually it's really difficult. And there's been a bit of a, that, that surge in mental health is definitely something that I have seen. Almost 50% of psychiatrists recognize that there was going to be an increase um, in the need for emergency care. And I've definitely seen that. One of the things that people worry about is what's the, the long-term consequences. And it's too early for us to start to say anything about what the long-term consequences might be. But looking back, people have been worried that risk of suicide increased during the Spanish flu and then during SARS in Hong Kong. It was published last week in the National Confidential Inquiry in Suicide and Homicide, that the suicide data looking at the first lockdown and the consequences of that not across the whole country but across certain regions suggests that there hasn't been a significant rise but sometimes we don't fully see that data um, straight away. So we've, we've got to identify the issues, we've got to recognise that there are risks and that people might not come forward uh, to get support so we might need to be able to signpost people to information. So the places that I often signpost people to the Royal College of Psychiatrists website mind mental health foundation um, and the, one of the key things to do at the minute is make sure that people are looking at good recommended uh, websites and information because a lot of people are getting misinformation there's a lot of fear there's a lot of panic and people then start to get carried away with uh, sort of things that aren't going to be helpful the way i think we need to make sure that we're supporting people's mental well-being is we've got to think about the biological things that they've got to do to manage them 
So we've got to make sure that we're eating properly, we're staying hydrated, we're sleeping properly. Sleep is a really key thing. A lot of people that I see struggle with their sleep and correcting that does have a big impact. Keeping active, uh, the, the research is out there um, and it shows that if we're active, um, it's as almost as good as taking antidepressants from a lot of the studies that we've seen. So uh, a lot of my patients get very fed up with me saying to them, I need to set them goals between now and the next appointment, but I want them to be trying to get back to running or yoga or Pilates or some form of physical exercise. because It's really important. So there are biological things that we need to be doing. We need to get outside and get fresh air, which is really difficult and very interesting seeing the study um, from Barry about what people did during lockdown, that people are going out in the middle of the day um, a lot of um, patients that I've seen have said, but I can't leave the desk. I have to sit behind my desk. But actually what you're missing is you're missing that morning commute. So some have said to me, what I do is I go out of the house, go for a walk for half an hour in the morning to walk home. And then when I walk in through the front door, that's at work. And at the end of the day, I do the same thing. So there are things that people need to do. You need to have that routine um, and you need to have building in the, the exercise around it. So as well as the biological things that people can do, there's the psychological things that we should be doing. So we do need to be careful about news and information. At the beginning of the pandemic, I'm sure like uh, uh, I was like a lot of people watching the news completely all the time, feeling that we had to see what was happening. This is a completely uh, unprecedented change to our day-to-day -day life. And it felt like it was changing so fast, you almost felt you had to keep up with it. I've now got a rule that I uh, sort of instill with all my patients that I see that half an hour maximum of looking at the news per day because you're absorbing too much other information and if you're constantly focusing and looking at things and searching for when's the vaccine going to be here and what's going to happen next it actually can be really bad for your mental well-being it is really important we think about where we're getting the information from and i think that's why the government have kept saying we've got to ask the experts we need to get expert advice on this we need to know how to deal with it and i think that it's really difficult as managers to make sure that you're able to always get that and I'll come to that in a second. So the, those are sort of the biological and the psychological things that people need to do, but the social sort of things that people need to do is find out they need to take time away from work. Um, a lot of the, at the beginning of the lockdown, a lot of people were very worried that working from home meant that a lot of people were just gonna be thriving and sitting there not really doing work. What I'm finding from speaking to uh, most of my patients is that they're doing longer hours their, their days sort of bleed into one. They, they get up, they start working, they might stop for a brief break, but then they continue working and then they're working later on in the day. People need to be able to have that downtime. People need rules about where they work. If you're working in a one uh, bedroom apartment, you need to be able to leave your room and not be working from your bed and then trying to sleep in at night because you won't be able to switch off. So people need to have that free time. And I've worked with a lot of, um, patients who have been able to speak to their employers and say, actually, I do need to be able to get away from work. So that is a really important thing to do. People need to keep their minds stimulated. They need to keep other activities going. People need to take up other uh, sort of interests um, and make sure that they're not just focusing on one aspect of their life. Connecting with people is a really challenging area because uh, we're doing this via Zoom. This is sort of new or what i've started talking to people about is not a new normal we're in a temporary normal we will go back to face-to-face -face meetings we will go back to conferences we will go back to doing things but at the minute we're having to do all these things remotely and actually connecting with people it can be quite exhausting if you're sitting in front of a computer screen all day doing zoom meetings the last thing you might want to do is then do a zoom family meeting later on in the evening but actually it's really important that we continue to do that and I think what people need to do is mix up the mediums that we do those things in. And it's really important that we've got that immediate environment. I feel very fortunate that as a healthcare professional, I've had to continue coming into work. But I know that for most people, it's being at home and your environment for work, for home, for everything is, is not changing. And that is difficult. So people do need to make sure that it is comfortable, it's appropriate, and they're able to get away from it at times. What can a manager do to support people? I think we need to think about sort of reasonable adjustments that can be made. Uh, I had a discussion with uh, a lawyer recently about uh, discrimination law. And I think it's really important that we think about what are the reasonable adjustments that can be made for people with work in these really challenging times. 
we've had this sort of constant change of work from home, go into work, work from home, go into work. And it's been very confusing for people and people haven't known what to do. What I would say is that if going into a work environment is helpful and it's possible, sometimes that is a reasonable adjustment for someone to do. So actually, if your office is open and you're able to get into work and you've got employees who've got mental health conditions and actually that social connection um, is important for them, then actually that might be a benefit for them that they can come in. It's going to be reduced numbers of people in the office. It's not going to be the same, but they might still need to be able to do that from time to time. One of the things that we've lost from doing everything via Zoom and all these remote meetings is the gaps in between meetings. So one thing runs straight on to the next, uh, which is difficult. And some, some employees have um, instituted a program so that when you log in, your meetings finish five minutes to the hour and start five minutes after the hour. So there's automatically an enforced break. And I think those sort of things need to be thought about. I think the other things that we need to think about are um, calling people and speaking to them. The corridor conversations have kind of got lost. Those conversations where you just go over to check with somebody about something, it's harder to do when you're trying to do everything in formulaic meetings. So I think we, I've already said, we do need to mix up how we um, support people. Talking to people over the phone is important, as well as doing things over the video. Sometimes seeing people is helpful, um, and I will do a lot of my consultations now via video, but sometimes you can do it, but the same thing over the phone and it just gives people that break from sitting in front of a screen as i've said already several times we need to make sure that any information that we're sharing is reputable um, and that it's official advice and not confusing and conflicting and sort of being made up and trying to be second guessed and that's been something that i've seen within a hospital setting trying to make sure that we are clear about what do we do about visits what do we do about people coming and going from hospital settings and i think people need to make sure that they're promoted to getting access to support and those techniques that they might be able to use to manage their mental well-being. And finally, the other bit that people need to do is taking on your leave, taking time out. It's really hard when you're told uh, you need to take time out and where you're going to spend your time out is in exactly the same place as where you've been for the last two weeks and it's going to be where you've been working. There is a difference between taking time off work and continuing to work. Um, I've recently been able to take some time out and you come back, you're refreshed and you're able to tackle things again. So it's really important that people continue to do some of those routine things that they would have done. The other issue that I think that's come up is managing kids with mental health issues. People are working from home. You've got, and during the first uh, lockdown, people had to manage their own kids, plus work, plus their own mental well-being, plus it was just it's too many things. So it's really important as an employee, uh, as an employer, sorry, to sort of think about um, children's mental health issues and how that might be impacting the situation at home and how people are able to do things. So the other things to think about are what can Priory do? So as you can see from the map, there's Priory wellbeing centres and hospitals scattered across the country. And I know Stuart said about things closing down from a private point of view. From our point of view, we very much kept open, but we have in some places re, uh, repurposed some wards for um, more NHS care. But on the whole, things have stayed open. Um, and we will treat any sort of uh, mental health issue in a variety of different settings. And most of the things that we're doing now um, have to be done remotely. So when the lockdown happened, I had to suddenly get a whole load of consultants and therapists who were not doing things remotely to start using Skype and Zoom and various other platforms. Um, and I thought that well, this is an opportunity. We need to find out What's this mean? What's this like? Is this the future of what we're going to be doing for uh, mental health care? And we surveyed everybody in July. And a lot of people found that roughly it's about the same, but there are some things that aren't quite the same. One of the things interesting that it's not the same is when you see someone face to face, you can't smell them. And that might sound like an unusual thing to want to be able to do. But if somebody has an alcohol problem, actually, you can't tell that over the computer. So you do need to be able to see people face to face at times. But as in comparison to where we where we were, it is it's a reasonable substitute, and we were we have been using it a lot. So you can see at the bottom of the slide there, about seventy four percent of the sessions done by Priory have been done via video. And um, speaking to my NHS colleagues, there's only about five percent were done in the NHS by that method. I'm mindful of time. I'm going to try and give you a chance for a couple of questions, but I just want to finish on a few quick points. So we looked at should we continue with remote therapy. 
And the overwhelming response, and I was quite surprised by the consultants who had been very negative about the idea of doing it this way, was that yes, we will continue it. We are in, we are in a new world where we've got to do things differently. So we probably will be continuing to do video sessions and video remote sessions. It's so much handier for a lot of patients to be able to step away from their desk, have a video call with me, and then go straight back to the desk rather than have to travel to a hospital or travel to a wellbeing centre. Um, so we probably will be continuing it, but not as the main format. Just with other things that we can do. So Priory, we've got a lot of um, experience of going out to services, going to GP practices, going to um, organisations, going to teams, doing some teaching, doing some support, helping people to sort of raise the awareness of mental health issues. And we're partnering with um, an app, My Possible Self, next year, um, which will be launched for all our patients to use. And it's basically got a mood tracker um, and lots of other um, factors in it that can help people to really think about their well-being and use some of those preventative methods. Um, so that will be something for us to sort of look at in, uh, in the future. And it is something that's recommended on the NHS apps uh, website. And I think that's a quick whiz through about where we are and what we what you might want to do to try and help support people. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Ed. Um, I really appreciate it. And taking on board one of the things you said about finishing meetings at 5-2 and the setting the next one at 5 past, I'm conscious you've got one at 4 o'clock. I have. And I'll ask you <laughs> two very quick questions. One picks up on the app, which is, do you think that that digital delivery of healthcare is the future so that people, whether it's mental health or, or any form of of interaction with their health is it going to be on their smartphone is that the way it's going to go so we're um, interestingly from doing the survey in the summer a lot of people are trying to do things um, with their phone but there's a difficulty sometimes when you're when you're holding your phone and you're trying to have a really sort of in-depth conversation about difficult aspects of your life you don't want to be able to do you don't want to have to do that and hold the phone so we're trying to make sure that the platforms are phones it's compatible with any technology um, I don't think we can use it as a complete substitution um, for seeing someone face to face. There is something very different. I, uh, working in a hospital, I continue to see patients in the hospital face to face, um, albeit with a mask and um, different sort of uh, things in place. But I think it's going to be a mixture. And from speaking to GP colleagues, uh, we know that they're, they're going to have to do the same sort of thing. I think some of it is it's sped up a process that we were sort of slowly edging towards but all of a sudden we just had to change and i think that the change it might not stick completely but it will be here in some form excellent one last question and then i'll let you particularly go um should we be teaching resilience in schools mental health resilience in schools i think there's already from what i can see since i started working in mental health sort of 17 years ago now um, I can see a change. Um, I can see that kids are now getting sort of well-being lessons. They are being taught more. I, I don't remember it being ever on the radar when I was at school, but it is being talked about. Uh, I, got, I think back to a time when I was working as a, a junior doctor, and one of my consultants went into a school and said, can everybody draw a picture? Everybody draw a picture of someone with mental illness. And all these kids drew pictures of monsters and scary things and very frightening things. And one kid drew their mum. And I think that was a really important thing. And I think that there is more awareness. Um, kids that I know will talk about it. They will talk about sort of mental illness. And I think the stigma is changing. But interestingly, there is still a stigma. People who come and see me say that the hospital I work in, uh, in Roehampton, People will use, used to use that as a bullying term when they were in the playground. You'll, you'll end up in the priory, you'll end up ill. Um, and some of those things are changing. And I think there are positive changes, but I think, yeah, the more we can do those sort of teachings and raising awareness and prevention, the better. Excellent. Ed, I will let you go. Thank you very much for walking us through that. That's uh, a valuable insight. I know that, that all of our speakers are going to make their presentations available, but actually I believe that you're also going to provide a handout that we can, we can send out to, to today's delegates so that they can pick up on some of the things that you've talked about in your presentation. Yeah, there, so were, some, there were some links within that that I'll put together. Yeah. Brilliant.